Good evening, everyone. While you're still noisy, if you would turn off your cell phones, that would be appreciated. Even when you're quiet, it would be appreciated. My name's Marty Prasman. The Ashton Jewish Study Program, and, and I have the honor of moderating our three rabbi panel series twice a year. It's now in its 17th year. Uh, I, I started it with a full head of hair. <laughs> Not true. But by the way, this year, uh, Columbia, South Carolina uh, imitated Rabbi. Uh, uh, this past February, it was uh, initiated Rabbi Al Sanders. On the three rabbi, uh, was initiated by Jeff Silverberg, the college, and for very long in the Jewish Student Union. Uh, Jewish Studies has had quite the exciting semester, and we're not slowing down any time. Now you'll have to listen. <laughs> I was very funny before. Uh, Jewish studies have had, had uh, quite an exciting semester. We're not slowing down anytime soon. Uh, on April 6th, a, a week from this Sunday, uh, we will hold our final Sunday morning brunch of the academic year. Ken Jacobson of the Anti-Defamation League uh, will lecture on the changing role of America in the world and the impact of that change on Israel. For those of you who have not joined us this semester or, or, or ever, uh, there's no better time to do so since uh, this is the last time we'll have a Sunday uh, morning brunch of this, uh, this semester for the next one won't be until September. Just beyond that event, uh, some of you know, is Pesach, uh, Passover, during which we'll serve two nights of seders uh, to hundreds of hungry students as well as three meals a day throughout the holiday. Uh, we're reliant on this time, uh, during this time, on community volunteers to help us prepare the meals. Uh, uh, the commitment is not that much, and the reward is very high. Uh, actually, the one uh, commandment that our kids seem to celebrate is, all who are hungry come to eat. They seem, they seem to come and eat. Uh, so if you're interested in volunteering, please sign up in the back of the room with uh, Mark or Dara. Uh, and uh, those of you, uh, on another note, who've walked past the Jewish Studies Center lately will have noticed that the BAR signs have been displayed, meaning that the long discussed dis construction of our building is moving it along. Uh, we've re received BAR approval. Uh, that might be evidence of the divine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, once complete, the 96 Wentworth will include a kosher vegan vegetarian dining hall open to the entire community, as well as additional classroom and office space. Uh, and the newly established Pearlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture will have a new, new home at the same time. We're excited about that. Just two other quick promotionals. Uh, the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina will hold its 20th anniversary on May 17th and 18th in Charleston. Those of you who've never been to one, who would like to attend, uh, please just call the office. We'll give you all the information you need. And uh, A World of Jewish Culture will be celebrating its 15th anniversary on the weekend of June 1st. Uh, I did so from the podium last semester, but would again like to offer a quick note on the format of this evening and future three rabbi panels. This event is unique in that it allows us to come together as a unified community and for our own religious leaders to speak on our behalf regarding issues of importance to the Jewish community at large. Uh, I actually think that the three rabbi panelists helped create the wonderful, cohesive Jewish community in which we live. For many years, Charleston was blessed with three synagogues uh, representing the three core denominations of Judaism in America. Recently, Dor Tikva was formed as a new Orthodox congregation 
and even more recently, it secured an excellent rabbi to lead it, Rabbi Michael Davies. Okay. That's before you speak. Uh, welcome, Rabbi Davies. It's good to have you in the community. But instead of a four-rabbi panel, and in the hopes of retaining a panel representative of the community's institutional Jewish demographic, Rabbi Moshe Davis of B'rith Shalom Beth Israel has graciously agreed to participate in every other discussion so that Rabbi Michael Davies may participate as well. I'd like to publicly thank Rabbi Davis for this strong expression of shalom bayit, shalom bayis, or shalom bayit, whichever. But it, it really is a sign that uh, this is a cohesive full Jewish community. I should also mention that Rabbi Radinsky, a founding member and longtime participant of the Three Rabbi Panel, will be in town one month from today on uh, April 27th. Uh, while in town, Rabbi Radinsky will deliver a class of Jewish studies on martyrdom of Rabbi Akiva. Back to tonight's topic, the role of the divine in Jewish belief. Last night, I watched the first installation of PBS's new miniseries, The Story of the Jews. The introduction of that episode, which included a recounting of God's many names, you'll have a handout to that effect, was also on my mind this morning. Elohim, El, El Shaddai, Adonai, Elyon, El Elyon, Avinu, Shabbat Shemayim, Melech, Melech HaMalachim, and of course, Hashem which literally means the name. We have had many names for God, and we have traditionally sought as Jews to have connection with the divine, one through sacrifice and now through prayer, study, and the ethical acts of Gamilut Hasidim and Tikkun Olam. Has the role of the divine changed over time, and if so, how? Our esteemed panelists will each have 12 minutes to answer this question and present their vision of the role of the divine in Jewish belief. Last semester, Rabbi Alexander closed the panel, so this semester we'll start with Rabbi Steffi, Stephanie Alexander of Kahal Kadosh Beth Elohim, followed by Rabbi Adam Rosenbaum of Synagogue Emanuel, and we'll finish with the new member of the panel, Rabbi Michael Davies of Congregation Dor Tikva. Uh, Stephanie Alexander. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? I've had the chance to welcome him personally. I've had the chance to welcome him privately. I've had the chance to welcome him over a video. But I'd like to, in your presence and company, welcome Rabbi Davies and his family here to Charleston. We're thrilled to have him here. We're thrilled to have his openness and community-mindedness amongst our colleagues here in the community. And I know that this evening we're going to welcome him by going easy in the Q&A period on Rabbi Davies. <laughs> And it's worth noting that my parents are here this evening, way back there. Which means you'll go easy on me in the Q&A period. So Rabbi Rosenbaum, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this afternoon, I had a two and a half hour long meeting. It was a good meeting, but it was two and a half hours long. And now I get to come in in 12 minutes, talk about God. <laughs> And truth be told, this is a good day that I get 12 minutes to talk about God. So I'm going to jump right in to what I think is one of the, at least one of the core questions, if not the core question of this evening, and that's with the necessity of belief in God as, to, as part of Judaism, to be a Jew. In 2011, an article came out in Moment Magazine, which asked the very provocative question, can there be Judaism without belief in God? And the article itself was a collection of responses from a variety of well-known and lesser-known Jewish thinkers. Among them, the political scientist Robert Putnam, who said, I don't know if it's theologically kosher to be a Jew and an atheist, but if it isn't, half the Americans who call themselves Jews aren't quite legit. Yes, sir. Journalist Marcia Geshen said, my understanding is that the question of belief in God is a private question. 
to be observant of Jewish traditions, you don't actually have to believe in your heart of hearts in God. You have to believe in the necessity of observing the tradition. And there was Rabbi David Wolpe, who said, yes, there can be Judaism without God, but only briefly, as it cannot reproduce itself. Judaism without God is running on the momentum of past generations. It can last a generation or two, but will disappear without the roots that gave it nourishment. I don't think, he says, that people will continue to light Shabbat candles because it's a cultural practice, but they will do it if they understand it to be a mitzvah. Absent a connection to God, Judaism cannot sustain itself. For many people, it's difficult to believe in God, and yet they feel deeply attached to their Judaism, but transmitting it will be, he says, an insurmountable challenge. Each of these three perspectives, and there were many more in the article, but each of these three particularly resonates with me, and each challenges me at the same time. Ultimately, I don't know that being Jewish necessitates a belief in God, but it does seem to ask for a commitment to wrestle with our belief or lack thereof. Every now and then, and it's really only every now and then, I will meet someone who professes with absolute certainty the belief that there is no God and can illustrate their reasons for believing so. And just about as rarely, I will meet someone who professes with equally absolute certainty the belief that there is a God and can articulate precisely who or what that God is. But more often, I listen to people who are somewhere in between. It's where I think most of us are. So are those of us in between believers? It depends. It depends on how certain we feel we need to be before we're willing to affirm our faith. I'd ask you to consider a process I use of self-evaluation when I work with individuals who are working toward conversion. I ask them lots of knowledge questions. I ask them belief questions. I ask them practice questions. I ask them skill questions. And I ask them to rate themselves on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being where they feel they should be at the time of conversion. Because for all of us, born Jewish or choosing to be Jewish, it's a lifelong pursuit. It never stops. You don't reach the end game at conversion. So what we need to know is where somebody feels they need to be at that moment. Use the example of Hebrew. For some, I think for most in my community, we might aspire toward being able to read and understand and maybe even speak Hebrew, but does that have to come at the moment of conversion? Or can that be a goal that you attain afterwards? In which case, if you're able to pronounce the prayers and follow along in the service, would you give yourself a 10 and say, I'm ready now? I probably would. But there's plenty of people I sit with who would say, no, I can't have a 10 until I know every word that I'm saying. That's when I'll feel authentically that I'm a Jew. There are people I would take to the Beit Din and the Mikvah tomorrow, but they're not ready and it's their call. Their idea of where they need to be along the lifelong Jewish journey at the time of conversion is different than mine. There's always more for us to do, but their authenticity comes from a certain level of um, what they already have under their belt as opposed to what's still ahead of them. And I think it's similar with belief in God. I have ideas, I have feelings, I have a personal theology of sorts, but I don't have anything resembling incontrovertible proof the experience of some of my days strengthen my beliefs. And then there are experiences on other days that challenge them. But I'm okay with that. I, even without a precise picture of who God is and how God works in the world, I feel I can still affirm my faith. Another just wouldn't be so comfortable doing so. But I think so long as both of us are engaged in the questioning, observing, reflecting, that is the end game of Jewish theology, rather than precisely articulated tenets of faith. Brad Gersel suggests that there are nine God questions which Jewish theologians address. The first is, what is God's nature? Number two, is there one God or more than one? Number three, what is God's name? Number four, how can we know God? Number five, what is God's relationship to the world? Number six, does God have a special relationship with the Jewish people? Number seven, what does God want from us? Number eight, how does God relate to me? And number nine, 
Why is there evil in the world? Ultimately, I think the asking and revisiting of these questions is more important in the Jewish theological pursuit than the answers of any given individual or moment. So when someone says, I don't believe in God, I follow the teaching that this is not the end of a conversation, but an invitation to begin one. My follow-up of choice is to invite them to share what they do believe in, and then to probe if there might be room for the divine in that belief. Often it seems that the word God is more uncomfortable than the concept itself. So how do we talk about God? Rabbi Larry Hoffman, in an article called Beyond Romanticism, Having Something Spiritual to Say, says the following. It's not the experience, but the language of God that eludes us. Jewish conversations are usually about Israel, current events, or oh my goodness, synagogue politics, but not spirituality. Believing that linguistic statements must correspond to empirical reality, we balk a theological conversation that operates according to other criteria of meaningfulness. But surely the task of education is precisely to teach us how to talk about such things. When it comes to spirituality, we can do more than just have it, encounter it, feel it, or smile knowingly about it. We can further it and deepen it by having something to say about it. And according to a survey uh, that he and sociologist Stephen Cohen undertook two years ago, the younger the respondent to their survey, the more that individual was apt to be thinking about God and wishing that they had mentors with whom to discuss spiritual matters. When Vicki Farhi, an outreach educator with the Union for Reform Judaism, came to our congregation a few years ago, her presentation helped me realize two important things that had somehow eluded me, totally escaped me until that moment. The first was how infrequently I, a rabbi was talking to my own child about God. And the second was how easy it can be to begin the conversation. So we began the very next day as we drove to preschool, actually to Miss Darlinda's class, and our conversation went like this in the car. Me, I see God in those birds flying so low and beautifully over the water. My son, I see God in that branch that a red-tailed hawk could land on. Me, I see God in you when you're such a great helper at home to your daddy. And he, I see God in you when you're at temple and you help pe make people smile. What a gift Vicki gave to both of us that day. And these are the kinds of conversations we need to be having with all of our members of all ages. Toward that end, Here's the current talk in my movement, the reform movement, about what congregations should be doing to introduce these God conversations around the table. The first is we need to be encouraging critical thinking. We need to be uncovering and examining our assumptions and then deciding whether to hold on to them or replace them. As we know, one of the beautiful things about our tradition is our understanding that critical thinking, far from undermining our connection to religious tradition, usually serves to strengthen it. So we need to mine down and see what those God images are that we carry from our youth or from other moments that we can't believe in, but are keeping us from identifying with those concepts that we can believe in. The second thing we need to be doing is exposing our seekers and learners to the broad, and it is broad, umbrella of Jewish theology. Whether it's Isaac Luria's mysticism, Martin Buber's philosophy of dialogue, Mordecai Kaplan's religious naturalism, or Rachel Adler's engendering Judaism, we need to expose our community to the diversity of ideas among Jewish thinkers, ancient, medieval, and modern. Third, I think this also means helping people appreciate the diversity of the ways that we can talk about, and perhaps more importantly, to God. So toward that end is the handout that you do have in your hand, which I would ask you to look at for just a moment. I use this with my Intro to Judaism classes. I use this with my Confirmation class. This is by no means an exhaustive list, which in and of itself I think is inspiring. But these are names that have been captured from the ancient uh, liturgy that's been handed down to us, many of them translated here into English, 
and newer, more modern prayers as well. All of these names that you would find in Jewish liturgy for God. And each one of them becomes evocative of a different image, a different picture of God. One of these might be inspiring to you, and another one might be inspiring to the person next to you. More importantly, one of these might be inspiring, you, inspiring for you today, and another one might be inspiring for you tomorrow. So for instance, at halfway down in the first column, shepherd of Israel. When you hear the word shepherd, we'll do this very quickly because I don't have a lot of time. When you hear shepherd, just shout out for me what kinds of images come to mind. What, what's that? Peasants. What else? Sheep. Moses. What does a shepherd do? Herd, protect, guide. Excellent. So can you think, and this is rhetorical now, can you think of a time in your life where those kinds of associations would be something that would draw something out of you or help you find a sense of calm, fill a sense of need that you have within? Second column, God of Abraham, God of Sarah, and fill in the blank with any individual you know had a unique relationship with God. And to be able to talk to that God and try and establish your own, that might open up a new avenue. End of the third column. Our father, our king, we know, Avinu Malkenu, our mother, evokes different images. Mentor, we spend a, a, some time in this exercise brainstorming all kinds of relationships that we have with others. Coach, teacher, um, lawyer, <laughs> consultant, all of these things, relationships that we can identify with, and at times we need a higher or deeply internal um, avenue for accessing those same relationships that we know about. Last column, the second one, the patient one. I can imagine calling out to the patient one when you yourself need to find a source of patience and guiding with other, being with, living with others. Or I can also see where you need a patient source in your life as you get out all the anxiety that you need to be able to pour out to. So we use language to be able to connect. And it doesn't mean that there are multiple different gods. It just means that there are um, different ways of accessing the one God. Let me keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> Almost there. Number four, we need to guide people in their search for a personal relationship. Ron Wilson has written, and I agree, the search for the evidence of God's existence shouldn't focus on the heavens, but here on earth. We should look to our hearts, not to the stars. And so we need to create settings and opportunities for our congregants to tell their stories, to tell of our personal God moments, our experiences of certainty, and our times of doubt. Number five, we need to offer opportunities for prayer. The conservative rabbinic leader, Louis Finkelstein, wrote, prayer is the way that we talk to God. Last week, a student asked in the session with Jonathan Sarna a great question. For younger generations, what if the language of our prayer doesn't work? Are there other ways that we can pray too? And so I would amend what Rabbi Finkelstein has said, and I think that prayer is the way that we express ourselves to God, and that can happen in lots of different ways. Yoga, meditation, art, song, it's the way that we communicate, not necessarily with words. What needs to happen, though, according to Jewish tradition, is it has to be done with some sense of regularity, and it needs to bring us into community. That's the concept of minion, right, with others. We need to offer opportunities for study. The compendium to that prayer is the way that we talk to God. Louis Finkelstein said that study is the way that we hear God's voice. That doesn't necessarily mean we hear God in the authorship of a text that we study, but themes emerge, ideas emerge that help us to hear God's voice. And finally, we need to offer opportunities for significant engagement in social justice. This has been a hallmark of Reform Judaism, and for many in our community, one of which we are particularly proud. For many of us, we feel God's presence when we feel ourselves engaged in fixing the world. At the most spiritual of levels, we sense our partnership with God, and we feel our own hands become the agent through which God's intentions for the world are made manifest. So to close with an excerpt from my movement's most recent platform, we encounter God's presence in moments of awe and wonder, in acts of justice and compassion, in loving relationships and in the experiences of everyday life. We respond to God daily through public and private prayer, through study and through the performance of mitzvot, sacred obligations, ben adam makom to God, and ben adam to other human beings. We strive for a faith that fortifies us through the vicissitudes of our lives, 
illness and healing, transgression and repentance, bereavement and consolation, despair and hope. In all of these ways and more, God gives meaning and purpose to our lives. Rabbi Rosenbaum. Thank you, Marty. I, too, of course, wish to welcome uh, Rabbi Davies to the Scrum, uh, to our uh, semi-annual uh, meeting. It is certainly a pleasure. I've uh, enjoyed the opportunity to get to know you and Aura and Yoshua and Hana. Um, Yoshua's in my son's class at Adelstone. It's uh, been lots of fun to be able to get to know the family. Looking forward to uh, more of that as well. I also, before I speak about the topic at hand, I uh, wish to certainly compliment uh, Marty and all of Jewish Studies on providing this kind of forum because we should not be taking this opportunity for granted. This panel is a celebration of diversity, and that is all the more important these days, and I certainly hope that the value of diversity will continue to be upheld and be close to the heart of those who make decisions for this university in the future. <laughs> So now on to something less controversial. <laughs> One of my professors at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, Dr. Bert Mazodsky, tells a story of when he was on a book tour after publishing uh, one of his latest volumes, and he was also on tour with uh, the eminent biblical scholar, Dr. Everett Fox, who had just published his translation of the Torah, uh, which is, he entitles the Five Books of Moses, and they are sitting together one day at the uh, autograph table at the book signing place, and uh, Dr. Bozotsky says to Dr. Fox, okay, don't you just feel a little weird doing this? <laughs> I mean, you're autographing the Torah. I mean, doesn't that just feel a little presumptuous, a little bit uncomfortable, and Dr. Fox responded, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I've actually figured it all out. When I sign the book, I always sign it F-X. <laughs> Problem solved. But Dr. Bozotsky asks, in all seriousness, an important question, which is, how can we approach God with respect and also without presumption? And I'm going to explore that question in, with, in three ways. First of all, I want to talk about how the conservative movement deals with how we approach God. Secondly, how we address God. And third, how we communicate with God. So first, the question of how we approach God. In the volume known as Emeh Emunah, Statement of Principles of the Conservative Movement, published in 1985, the very first sentence of the entire, uh, the entire piece is, we believe in God, unequivocally. But as it goes on to explain, the parameters of belief in God are wide open. Conservative movement prides itself on being a big tent for ideas, a big tent for observance. And when it comes to theology, this is no exception. I like to think of what the conservative movement has to offer theologically as an excellent way of exploring Moses Maimonides' idea of negative theology. Let me explain what I mean by that. Negative theology is to say that God is so much in a different realm than humanity that we are really not supposed to be able to say God 
is this, God is that. We need to be very reluctant to say those things. We can say God is not something, but not God is. So in other words, to say God is good, well, what are we talking about? Are we talking about what we as humanity believe is good? Or are we putting a human construct on what good means? We can say God is not bad. And when I say not bad, I'm not saying, you know, just okay. I mean, you understand what I mean. Um, so that is a, a very overgeneralized summary of negative theology. We have to acknowledge that God is ultimately unknowable at the end of the day. So all of this adds up to the conservative movement embracing a diverse understanding of God, diverse understandings of God. Is God a being? Or is God found in nature and not necessarily as one being? There are strands within the movement that embrace both or either. Is God the author, the singular author of the Torah? Is God a co-author with humanity? Does God, did God simply inspire humanity to write, to write Torah? All of these views are held within the movement. Regarding halakha, Jewish law, the conservative movement believe strongly that halakha is our understanding of what God expects from us. But our understanding of the revelation, our understanding of what God has revealed to us, evolves over time. And so humanity, the great rabbinic sages of every generation, must have a full part in this process as well. And when it comes to questions of evil, why evil exists, why evil impacts the people that it impacts. There are those who will simply say that the problem of evil is simply a misuse of our God-given free will. Others will say that these are God's actions that we cannot fully understand. All of these are within the parameters conservative movement. All of these are ones that we can embrace and thankfully debate and challenge one another over the course of our time together. Secondly, I'd like to talk about how we address God. And some of this is going to be representative of the movement at large. Some of this is going to be from my own personal biases. Please understand before I say some of this that I know that there are going to be a number of you who are going to wildly disagree with it, that's okay. That's what we're here for. It's all good. In the times of the temple, we knew the name of God. Right? There was a knowledge. Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would announce it. Yom Kippur afternoon. But our understanding is that that pronunciation has been lost. Has been lost with the destruction of the temples, etc. So all that we know about God's official name, I mean, the, the handout notwithstanding, we you know we have many different expressions for God, certainly different names for God, but the yud Hey vav and Hey. that's the closest we have. And there are consequences to that. So one of the things that I have told my congregation before is that I think saying the, the word Hashem when referring to God is respectful but is unnecessary. Hashem means the name. It's fine. But I also feel personally a little strange referring to God as the name. I feel like it's very close to saying what's his name. It doesn't sit well with me, personally. All right? Uh, I feel like that's a little too close to he who must not be named, and then I'm talking about Voldemort, and that's certainly, <laughs> that's certainly the last thing I want to talk about when we're speaking about God. So, to me, Hashem 
is, again, it is respectful, it is kind, it is not what I feel is a necessary way to do it. I have no issue with referring to God, even in common conversation, as Adonai. Because what does that mean? It means my Lord. I also feel that writing out, referring to God, writing out G-D is also unnecessary. First of all, because sometimes in word processors, it'll like it'll say G and then a dash, and then the D will be on the next line, and then you have no idea what to be talking about. <laughs> and also, I think referring to God as God is not, even on print, is not taking God's name in vain. Why do I feel like it's important to share this specifically? My feeling is that we have enough barriers between ourselves and God. Why would we want to create more? The third topic I'd like to mention is how we communicate with God. <coughs> Prayer, of course, is a powerful exercise. It's one of the most important things we do. The words in our prayers sometimes speak directly to our hearts. And there are other times when, depending on what our own personal theology might be, the words of the prayer might feel really presumptuous. How do I know this? Do I really feel right now, in my own theological journey, that this is the case? Sometimes what we read in the Siddur goes against our beliefs. I know I've shared this with my congregation before in recent weeks. But there have been times in my life when my doubt in God has been very high. And during difficult personal times, such as when my parents became separated, and I would be trying to pray the Friday night service, and I just couldn't do it. I said, I, I can't. I can't go on. I can't in good conscience say these words. What I learned during that time of my life, and what I try to communicate with my congregation and, and now to all of you, is the important thing is to keep the conversation going with God. Keep the conversation going, no matter how much our theology evolves. Try to say the words. Notice, by the way, it never says how we have to say the words. We can say the words with tears in our eyes, say with anger, sarcasm, frustration, inquisitiveness, surprise, love, joy. We can pour all of our emotions into these words so that when the moment arrives where we're really feeling that the words speak to us, we'll be there. We'll be ready. Almost. Almost. Up. So in summary, I realize that what I've described shows us that in conservative movements, we might not fully know about God. But God is all we have. And it is our religious responsibility to keep seeking God in all of our days. Thank you. Now I'm Michael Davies. First, I want to thank Marty and the uh, College of Charleston Jewish Studies Center for the uh, opportunity to share words with you this evening. Um, I also want to thank uh, my esteemed colleagues on the panel. Um, I learned a tremendous amount of them since my arrival in Charleston and a tremendous amount of this evening already. So thank you very much uh, for the words that you've shared already. Thank you. What I'd like to talk about tonight is about seeing God. 
And to talk about, if you talk about seeing God, we have a question. Do you think you can see God? Well, I think you can. And I want to rephrase that, and I may be repeating a little bit. It's the, uh, I chose to go last, by the way, so I brought it upon myself. But the actual word God doesn't do very much for me. God is an English word of German derivation and isn't found anywhere in the Bible, well, at least not in the Hebrew original. And the problem is that the word God has been so overused and abused and misunderstood that it actually stands in the way as a barrier, as Rabbi Rosenbaum put it, in seeing what we truly seek. Think of the classic Calvin and Hobbes comic strip. Hobbes, the toy tiger and imaginary friend of Calvin, asks him, Calvin, do you believe in God? Calvin's reply, well, I know someone's out to get me. <laughs> Unfortunately, many people harbor an image of God as some kind of almighty, heavenly bully who is out to get them. They say, I just wish that he would leave me alone. I don't bother him. He shouldn't bother me. I mean, look at this thing on my head. You know what it is? It's a bullseye. <laughs> hey, God, I'm right here. Come and get me. Did you ever notice, by the way, that classic movies, Ten Commandments is a uh, prime example, always had the role of God played by someone with a booming, loud, oppressive sounding voice. When they were looking for actors, I bet there was a sign outside of the audition room saying, actors with sweet, gentle voices need not apply. <laughs> with this image of God so prevalent, it's no wonder that there are many people in the world who have trouble seeing and experiencing the divine in their daily lives. One of the problems, and Rabbi Rosenbaum re referenced this, Rabbi Alexander as well, is that there are so many names but how can we truly affix a name to this experience? Perhaps one of the reasons why we do refer to God as Hashem, as the name, because there are so many names, and those names, I believe, act as barriers in and of themselves for seeing and experiencing God. Hashem meaning the name, as Rabbi Rosenbaum mentioned, we lost the pronunciation for the name of God that we've had, Yud, and hey, and bub, and hey. But this is actually a combination of three Hebrew, three Hebrew words, the forms of the verb to be. Was, haya, is, hove, and yihia will be. Suggesting the timeless source and context of all being. The experience of this Hashem cannot really be captured in words or concepts. Because how can a human mind imagine the ultimate timeless reality. 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche proclaimed that God is dead, but he also said that unless we experience an infinite whole working through us, our lives have no meaning. Nietzsche didn't believe in God, and quite honestly, neither do I. I believe in the infinite whole, the one who was, is, and always will be. I believe in Hashem. We don't, and indeed cannot, have an understanding of Hashem. What we can do is have a relationship with Hashem. I think the greatest obstacle that we have in experiencing this, in having this relationship and seeing Hashem, is the filing cabinet of labels and preconceptions. We know what everything is and where it goes. We have labels for all of them. They're called words. Label for this, label for that. Oh, what's that up in the sky? That beautiful color. Oh, that's a sunset. All right, now it's just a word. Oh, and that flying thing up in the air? Beautiful blue, oh, it's a bird. Oh, that's it, a bird, okay. When we say that we understand something, what we really mean is that we know which file to stuff it into. True understanding is knowing that there are things beyond our comprehension. And when we begin to discover and recognize the incomprehensible, 
that is where we discover Hashem. Hashem becomes believable when life becomes unbelievable. This evening, when I return home, I miss bedtime, as I often do. I'm going to walk into my children's room to say goodnight to them. And there's something palpable in the room. A sense of presence greater than me, greater than the kids, and even greater than the clutter from a long and excited day. Through the calm and serenity of my sleeping children, I see Hashem. In truth, we can only come to know Hashem experientially, not intellectually. It's like chocolate. Now, I don't have pieces of chocolate to hand out to the whole crowd. I apologize. Next, next panel. Someone can define it for you. Fermented, roasted, shelled, and ground cacao seeds often combined with a sweetener or flavoring agent. But if you've ever tasted chocolate, is that what chocolate is? Do you truly know what it is by reading a definition? You have to experience it in order to know it. After all, the most wonderful things in life are unprovable, unexplainable, and yet very real. Take love, for instance. Not a thing at all, but extremely real. In fact, more real than many other things that we know. We can see God in the love and the relationships, through the love and the relationships that we have. We can see God through the beauty in the world around us. We can see God in the power, through the power. Now, this may be a dangerous exercise, considering that you've already sat through two and a half rabbinic sermons this evening. But if you would indulge me for a moment, those of you who are comfortable, take a few seconds and close your eyes. Try to picture life. Whatever it is that you would picture, life. Whatever you're seeing right now in your mind's eye, you know that that is life. You know it not with your analytical brain, but with your soul. Because your soul has the capacity to see the divine quality that is called life. Keep your eyes closed for just another moment. And picture love. Perhaps the picture in your mind is a mother kissing her child. But all your eyes see is a big creature pressing moist lips on the cheek of a small creature. Your soul, however, knows that this is love. When you see these qualities, these qualities that we can't analyze intellectually, but we can feel emotionally and in a deep sense of our soul, then you are seeing Hashem. When I'm standing in front of the Grand Canyon, am I in awe of the big pit in the ground? Or am I encountering the grandeur of Hashem through the Grand Canyon? Am I in awe of the stormy sea, water surging up and down, or is it the quality of power that is manifested through the sea? When I see the sun set over the Ravenel Bridge, am I just intrigued by colors mixing in the atmosphere? Or am I drawn to Hashem's beauty through a palette like no other? Now, many of you know individuals sitting in the back corner over here, Mark Swick, as the community liaison of the Jewish Studies program here at the College of Charleston. I know Mark Swick originally from that relationship. But I also know him as a, fi I think, famous, I don't know, it's a relative term, uh, Instagrammer. Instagram, for those of you who don't know, is an online photo sharing, video sharing, and social networking service created in 2010 that enables its users to take pictures and videos, apply digital filters to them, and share them on a variety of social networking services. If you don't know what social networking is, I'm not gonna be able to help you with that right now. <laughs> if you take a look at my Instagram feed, and 
I think if you take a look at Marx as well, what you'll find, and many others, what you'll find is how those individuals are seeing Hashem through this world. You'll see pictures of my family, of my children. So you'll see pictures of beautiful sunsets, of the angel oak, of amazing things, and of music, beautiful and wonderful things in this world, through which I see Hashem. Mark put uh, doors and windows so you can see through those as well. But it's a tool that we can use to see Hashem. Now allow me to share with you, in closing, <laughs> a personal experience I had just the other evening, just last night. I was traveling back from Washington, D.C. on an airplane. We were 18,000 feet in the air. At this point, I wasn't thinking about mechanics of the machine that is able to lift several dozens of people way up in the air and carry them for great distances at magnificent speeds. I'm looking out the window in awe of the fact that I'm able to do this. I look down and see the twinkling lights of the many cities we passed over, and the beauty of it all strikes me. Meanwhile, due to recent updated allowance of mobile devices throughout the plane, I'm listening to a melody on my headphones with gorgeous harmony. Tears begin to come to my eyes as I realize that I am experiencing Hashem. There are many windows through which we can look in our lives. Many moments and opportunities that we can find. Don't just see the window. Look through it. You'll be amazed at what you can experience. Thank you. We'll take a few questions. Thank you for the qu thank you for the question. Um, I don't actually have a notice on the back of my card here that says "Please press the button for the microphone to talk." Apparently, I've, uh, I'm in the lower age bracket, so. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's an excellent question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understood. I understand the difficulty in articulation. Um, in, in terms of trying to recognize the, the timeless uh, entity um, that we understand that, and I refer to as Hashem, and part of the challenge is that we can understand it and we have to grapple with that. Um, there is a broader idea that, as I mentioned, the soul a number of times in my, in my talk, there's an understanding that the soul is actually an aspect, if you will, a ray of the light that is Hashem. And perhaps Hashem is represented in the finite world and in the, if you will, the, the, the world that is limited by the fourth dimension of time in who we are as people, as finite beings. And perhaps that's a way for us to understand it in seeing Hashem through ourselves and what we can bring to the world. We'll take another question. In the back, stand up and loud. Um, 
Uh, first, I want to preface my question um, the fact that can everyone um, that I am Jewish and I speak Hebrew and my dad's Israeli and I visit uh, Israel every year. Um, and my question was again uh, about prayer. Um, when I go to synagogue and I, I grew up Orthodox, I, I have to fill in and everything like this. Um, but when I'm in a you know in shul on Saturday, um, I don't really feel you know connected, and I don't think people my age really feel connected. Is there? Um, something we can do differently besides prayer or something we can do differently as a community to connect? So, 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 the, so the question was, um, I don't know if everyone heard the question, uh, uh, it's, it's a student who's interested in prayer, attends prayer, but it doesn't speak to him uh, as, uh, as an institution. Uh, so, Okay. Were you the one who asked the question last week too? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I'll elaborate on the longer paragraph. I did. I cut because of <laughs> the pressure from the side over here. But I, I sat with your question all week, and I thought it was a beautiful one. And I liked how you had prefaced it at the time by referencing the sacrificial system. That's how we used to draw close to God, and that's the root of the of the word sacrifice, korban. It was, it, you, you took something down here, you set it on fire, and so it, poof, as though it transferred itself through smoke up there. And there's actually imagery of God being a big nostril up in the sky, <laughs> pleased with that wonderful thing. But that was it, you, trans, you, you went across that space and you drew close. And when sacrifice was deemed no longer appropriate through historical reasons, we segued, it was always there, but it, it became um, fixed and communal in a way that it may not have been before prayer. And Avodah Shebalev, this worship that was in our hearts um, instead of worship that we put down on an altar. And somehow that was transferring us across that space or bringing God closer to us across it or we were meeting somewhere in the middle. I think that's the goal of worship. And so if the language isn't working, I, I guess I would differ with, with Rabbi Rosenbaum and say the language is not what we stick to. We stick to the purpose of it, to try and establish a relationship to two things, to that, that divine entity, however it is we understand it in that moment, however it is we connect, and to community. I think that piece has to stay there. And we do that by having fixed opportunities um, and by inviting people to come along the journey with us. So whatever form it might take through experimentation, I, you know, I listed a few, but art, music, meditation, yoga, um, dance, drug, walks, nature, I don't know what it is. I think you have to try and do it at least in part with others. There's room for personal and private, but that communal piece needs to stay there. Um, and the goal is what's in mind. Go back to the sacrifices again. We offered sacrifices when we felt like we needed to repent. We offered sacrifices when we were overcome with gratitude for what was in our lives. We offered sacrifices just on a regular basis to try and keep the lines of communication open. It was time you offered a sacrifice. So with those same purposes, those same intents, and the same goal of drawing close, I would say as long as those pieces are there, it can remain Jewish um, and, and do experiment. But don't lose the liturgy entirely. We change. And so keep going back to it. I guess that's, that's a fundamental principle of Reform Judaism. You don't make a choice and it's lifelong. You keep revisiting. You keep seeing. And maybe a word will speak to you. Maybe a whole paragraph. Maybe an entire book. So keep it there. But don't feel that that's, that's it. I uh, deeply respect uh I deeply respect the feedback here. <laughs> How's that? Okay. I deeply respect your struggle and uh, certainly appreciate the question that you asked. John Lennon famously said that life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. With apologies to him, I would like to uh, steal from that and say at least what I've found is that inspiration happens when you're busy making other plans. You know, we, uh, certainly when learning about prayer, uh, there's all of this 
literature about how, okay, here you're supposed to, you know, here we're trying to feel this when we're saying the Shema. We're trying to feel that when we're, when we're saying the Amidah. And if you can do that, fantastic. I find that sometimes I do some of my best thinking while I'm in the midst of prayer. And sometimes the thinking has nothing to do with the prayer itself. But it's an, the great thing about a prayer service is that it's an opportunity to just be. We have so few opportunities in this world anymore where we can just be and let our minds wander. So I would say regarding that, that much like a lot of things, a lot of the most important things in this world, the great moments seem to happen when we are looking for it and when we least expect it. The other thing that I've noted, uh, certainly in the style of prayer uh, that we employ at our synagogue, is that, yeah, there are a lot of times when we're going through a cage in the Siddur and, you know, there it, it goes by very fast and we're saying the Hebrew fairly quickly and uh, sometimes, you, you know, you might feel that, gosh, wow, I, we just called this page and suddenly we're done with it. How did that happen? Uh, it feels very fast. But I think that there's a big part of prayer that's rhythmic, that sometimes the exercise in saying the words as well as we can and going through it as well as we can, that eventually something sticks. And again, I feel it's when we least expect it. I don't have much to add to uh, what my colleagues have shared already, just two uh, very uh, brief points. One is that I have a uh, friend and mentor who finds that his best conversations with, with Hashem are actually in the car. Um, and the reason is because he's in a place by himself, usually trying to get from one place to another, as Herbert Rosenbaum um, mentioned. And that's his moment to say, okay, God, it's just me and you. Um, here's what I have to say. And now is the time because I'm stuck in this car and I, it's, there's traffic, whatever it might be, not so much traffic here in Charleston. <laughs> but um, that's, that's an opportunity um, to take to find that connection that you may not be finding in the set service. But in terms of the service itself, um, there is a famous rabbi who I am blanking on his name at the moment. Um, but had a special Siddur prayer book that was made for him, that was created specially for him, in which he took the Amidah, the Shmona Esrei, the uh, central piece of um, our service, and he set it up that each paragraph actually went through the entire paragraph, and then right before the concluding blessing of each of the paragraphs, there was a huge blank space, and the, and the closing blessing was at the bottom of the page. And this was so that this particular individual, this rabbi, could fill in whatever he wanted in the midst of that prayer. Anything that he wanted, anything that he felt, it fit into that particular category, fit into that particular area of prayer. And then, you know what, there's a catch-all at the end anyway. So anything you missed earlier on, you can stick it in that. But blank part of the page, because really our Siddurim, our prayer book, should all have blank parts of the page where we can fill in what our own personal desires. What's bugging me today? Listen, God, here's what's going on, and I want to share it with you. And that's really, I think, a way that we can connect with the set service by sticking in those blank pages and filling them with whatever it is that's uh, bugging us uh, that particular day. Southern Baptist preacher man. And I have uh, wanted the opportunity to ask three thoroughly trained theologians what they think of, of uh, what I've come up with my concept, my human sized concept of God. Because I'm, uh, I no longer, uh, I no longer adhere to the theology that I was taught as a child. But if I was to try to give a human-sized definition of God, 
indeed, if uh, God is not caused, God is. God is in everything inescapable and everywhere. And in sum or in brief, God is the aggregate sum, the conglomerate, or a conglomerate of all of the energizing forces at work in the universe. And I would like to know what you three thoroughly trained theologians think of that and are willing to tell me what you think of that without fear or hesitation of any kind. <laughs> What we have, we have a, uh, a summary of God as being everything and all the energy in the world as a definition of God. Uh, and as a theologian, what, what is your response to that? So going back to the idea of Jewish theology as an umbrella, that fits very comfortably in the umbrella and probably speaks to many of us here, at least part of it, or it's a part of our own theologies. Um, I pick up particularly on the, the idea of unifying. I think it's Many of us look for something that can tie all the pieces together, the idea of energy, um, power, force. And I'm actually going to use this as an opportunity for a, a plug, if I might, because I an anticipate finding God in a Baptist church on April 7th. Um, and there will be a lot of energy surrounding that experience. Um, I'm a part of the Charleston Area Justice Ministry. My congregation, KKBE, supports it. And in that room that evening, we will have about 500 individuals of all faiths and all walks of life who are feeling that our belief in God, whatever it might be, is, acting, is asking us to bring our energy together and to direct it toward making our community a better place. Um, and so I think that fits in with, with what you're saying and, and is a driving force for me too. So, so God is, is basically, is the sum total of everything, right? It's some sort of everything. So God is Google, right? God is Google. All right, I mean, I mean just, just make sure. Um, sure, okay, all right. So I, I, I will, I will uh, let me respond in this way. The, one of my favorite prayers in our liturgy is called Baruch She'amar, which means blessed is the one, Baruch She'amar Baha'i Olam Baruchu. Blessed is the one who created who spoke and then the world was created. Blessed be that one. It's open-ended. It leaves all of these opportunities for your or anybody else's theology to, uh, to be applied. And so I, I think that in your, in your search, I think those are some prayers that you might be interested in looking at. Um, to be able to look at these sorts of open-ended things. I think it is much more open-ended than we usually think. All I'm going to say is yes, <laughs> and so much more. Uh, we'll have time for one last question, if there is one. Well, seeing none, I'd like to uh, congratulate the community on having three wonderful rabbis in its midst. <laughs> and uh, Rabbi Davis, uh, who is very tall, if he'd stand up, he's very tall. Uh, and because uh, Rabbi Davis really was altogether gracious in foregoing the opportunity to be on the panel uh, tonight. Uh, to allow, allow Rabbi Davies to be on the panel. So thank you very much, Rabbi Davies, and thank you all for coming out tonight.